The presenting sponsor of the NOFA Mass podcast is Chelsea Green Publishing, an employee-owned company that is the leading publisher of books on the politics and practice of sustainable living, publishing authors who bring in-depth practical knowledge to life and give readers hands-on information related to organic farming and gardening, permaculture, ecology, the environment, simple living, and so much more. Enter code NOFA35, that's capital N, capital O, capital F, capital A, 35, at checkout on chelseadgreen.com and receive a special NOFA podcast discount on your next purchase. And be sure to sign up for their newsletter to stay up to date on new releases and to stay connected with Chelsea Green. Chelsea Green, publishing the politics and practice of sustainable living. NOFA Mass and this podcast are also sponsored by you, our members. We couldn't do all of our work educating farmers and gardeners on sustainable practices, advocating for farmers and the environment through our policy, or create such a vibrant community without your support. Thank you so much. This week on the NOFA Mass podcast, you're going to catch a buzz because we're talking all about bees. What is the state of our bees 10 years after the colony collapse crisis? Can you truly have organic honey? I'll also give you an update on the Pollinator Protection Act and some tips about how you can help bees in your own backyard. We'll also be hearing my interview with the amazing Angela Roel, a beekeeper extraordinaire, and their journey to beekeeping and their upcoming workshops on apiary management. Also, their favorite queen bee name. Plus, this week's farm hacks and farm fails from you, our listeners. Don't go anywhere. We're going to hive a great time. Hello, my farmy friends. I'm Lydia, and I'll be your host for this amazing podcast from the Northeast Organic Farming Association, Massachusetts Chapter. We're kicking off our podcast series with a buzz. I mean a bang. Are we at the pun limit yet? I hope not, because bee puns are sweet. Okay, that's my last one, I swear. Maybe. Okay, beekeeping is right up there as one of the oldest forms of agriculture. There is a cave painting outside of Valencia, Spain, that depicts a honey seeker from 8,000 years ago. And honeybees were kept in Egypt, and they even would put sealed pots of honey in with their buried pharaohs. In China, around 770 BC, there was a book written with sections describing how important it is to have a quality box for the bees to make the best honey. The ancient Maya domesticated and bred the stingless bee, whose great, great, great grand cousins are still used in Australia today for their honey production. Our relationship with these amazing little critters has a long history, and we have benefited by having honey to eat, wax to work with, and pollinators for our crops. But have the bees benefited from us? Well... I'm sure you have heard about colony collapse by now. It's been about 10 years since we first heard about farmers finding their hives mysteriously empty of bees. Soon it was clear that it was affecting thousands of apiaries all over the country and that very similar things were happening to native bee populations and to the beekeepers in other countries. I remember being in college and writing a Facebook post along the lines of, I never thought the apocalypse would start with bees. And though I was being a total drama queen, the loss of bees would be devastating as they pollinate one third of the plants we eat. Also, a cup of tea without honey? Come on. Anyway, after some scientific scrambling to figure out just what the heck was going on, it was determined that the bees were becoming cognitively impaired and unable to function as a hive or to forage for food. Scientists found that many different factors could be at play. But chief among these factors are neonicotinoid pesticides. They're used widely throughout conventional agriculture. Currently, U.S. hives are still struggling, with apiaries reporting a 28% colony loss over the 2015 to 2016 winter, and many wild species are declining. But fear not, my dear listener. There are ways the world is becoming safer for our little winged friends and ways that you can help. Three simple and powerful ways to help the bees and my interview with Angela after this. 
The Nova Mass podcast is supported by The Flexible Farmer, a massage practice in Hadley, Massachusetts, that is dedicated to helping farmers and other hardworking folks recover from work-related injury. Visit them at theflexiblefarmer.com to learn more. And we're back. Okay, so we know we love bees, and we know that we have to take some serious steps to help them out since things like pesticides and climate change are threatening their existence. Here are three things you can do right now to help make the world a more bee-friendly place. First, take action. Nova Mass, along with Friends of the Earth and our legislative sponsor, Carolyn C. Dykema, developed the Mass Pollinator Protection Act. It requires that neonicotinoids be applied only by licensed or certified applicators. It limits the application during the blooming season to agricultural and horticultural uses only. And it establishes a special commission to investigate pollinator health, comprised of farmers, beekeepers, environmental activists, and scientists. The bill is called H2113 and has now moved to the Ways and Means Committee with serious momentum. With our continued efforts and your help, we can get it over the finish line in 2018. Learn how you can help by going to nofamass.org and under the Programs tab, click on Policy. Second, you can increase the bloom. Whether you're a farmer with access to tons of land, a gardener, or you just have a window box, you can help bees survive by using whatever space you have to plant blooming flowers. Bees need 250 pounds of nectar to survive a winter. Pounds, you guys. Think about how small a bee is. And the more flowers for them to forage, the better. You can plant them as row breaks between fields or garden beds. You could till up a little slice of your lawn to plant or even grow some in a five-gallon bucket on your porch or your stoop. Look for flower seeds and starts that are wild or native because these are the ones that bees love to love. And if you plant many different types that bloom at different times of the summer and fall, you'll feed even more little buzzers. Third, support your local and organic apiaries. But this step is a little tricky because it's hard to say if honey can be organic at all. So because bees forage all over the place, it's really hard to keep them from coming in contact with pesticides. And in the good old U.S. of A., the federal government does not inspect for organic honey. Though you can get the USDA-certified label on a jar of honey, they have no regulations to define what that means. Oh, federal government and your confusing ways. So your best bet? Buy local from a beekeeper or farm store that you trust. That way you not only support your local food system, you know you're not getting bamboozled by a label that may not mean anything. Now that we know all about our little pollinator pals and what we can do to support growing their populations, let's hear from an amazing apiarist. Apiarist? Apiarist. a beekeeper, and agricultural educator, and all-around great person, Angela Roel. They own Yardbirds Farm, a homestead and honey business operating out of Montague, Mass. Angela is not only passionate about bees and keeping their own apiary, they are also amazingly knowledgeable and teach others as faculty at UMass, Greenfield Community College, and Franklin County House of Corrections. And Angela will be presenting a two-part workshop for NOFA Mass on March 3rd and 10th in Montague. Let's hear our chat. Hi, Angela. It's really nice to talk to you this morning. Hi, Lydia. Good to speak to you. So I'm so glad that we get to talk to you for the NOFA Mass podcast about beekeeping. Um, uh, You're going to be hosting a workshop uh, through NOFA in Montague coming up on the 3rd of March, and so we figured we'd give you a call and talk to you all about bees. So um, how did you get into beekeeping to start with? Yeah, good question. So I started beekeeping in 2000, oops, nope, Uh, 2010. (laughs) Wow, all the years are bleeding together. <clears throat> so I started beekeeping in 2010, um, and I got into it because I happened to pick up a book from a book swap called A Year with Bees um, by a woman, I think whose name is Sue Howell or Sue Hobbit. And it's all about how she left her career in New York and moved to the Ozarks, and um, part of her new career there was 
maintaining a hundred hives. And so she writes it in this memoir style where you hear stories of her life and stories of her bees, and there's a little bit of anatomy as well as, like, management styles and tactics. And I just was completely enamored. At the time, I was um, pretty involved in urban agriculture and um, guerrilla gardening and reclaiming old lots for community garden space um, and food for all gardens. And so this just seemed like a natural progression um and i went to a beekeeping meeting that was sort of just a gathering of of minds of beekeeping minds and interested parties in beekeeping um at my friend jean-claude Baruch's house who actually used to be a NOFA board member um before he moved back to france to be a full-time beekeeper um and jean-claude became my mentor and friend and really guided me in those first steps in backyard beekeeping. Um, and we, with a collection of several other folks, uh, started the first Boston Area Beekeepers Club and the Tour to Hives in Boston and Cambridge, which is now an annual event that happens in the first couple of weeks of June every year where um, several people bike through different parts of the city and tour apiaries and beekeepers from all over the area open up their apiaries for the bicycle tour. Um, so that, I sort of just jumped two feet in with beekeeping and became completely enamored with it. I mean, I love intricate, complex systems, and it is an intricate, complex system. Um, I have a little bit of background in sort of genetics and biology, and so it really resonated with that part of me that I was eager to reconnect with. Um, and that. That is the story of how it started, and then it sort of snowballed from there. Um, we kept bees when we were running a small um, green farm, and we ran that for several years and had a sort of sideline of bees that produced honey, and we made some wax products from the wax we collected from the hives. Um, and then a few years ago, I got a grant from the Mass Department of Agriculture and Resources to expand that apiary, and now I run anywhere from 25 to 60 hives throughout the year, and most of my focus at this point is on rearing um, quality queens for the Northeast. I also do some education at the University of Massachusetts and in collaboration with organizations like NOFA. Wow. So you really got passionate about bees and just took off with it. That's so cool. Um, So you talked about how many hives you had. You have about 25, you said? Right now we have about 40, um, and we have them oh, here wow. on the farm in Montague. Yeah, we have about 25 on the farm in Montague, and then we have a couple of satellite apiaries in different parts of the valley, um, and some of those are in collaboration with people who um, just want to support pollinators, and so they support me in being a beekeeper, and I keep bees on their property um, for a small fee, and then some of them are other farms where people um, need a larger amount of pollination, and we've worked out a contract where I keep bees in exchange for giving them some honey. So, um, awesome. yeah. So building community along with building your own uh, apiary. Very cool. So um, what made you want to take an organic approach to beekeeping? Yeah, great question. You know, I, I think about this a lot um, more and more all the time in the beekeeping world. Um, so when I first got started, it just happened that when I stumbled into beekeeping um, after reading a book about it, <laughs> my mentor was a treatment-free beekeeper, and he used organic practices um, and really tried to stay true to um, what the bees needed. He also did some treatments for Varroa. So Varroa is a mite that um, feeds off of the lymphatic system of honeybees. And it's really mm. intense um, pest that, that really can knock down the health of hives. So my mentor, Jean-Claude, did some intervention for Varroa um, with low chemical treatment, but he really tried to integrate that into um, the management system. And so I just picked it up from him and then I started learning about all these different practices and there's um, integrated pest management practices and there are treatment-free beekeepers and there are beekeepers that use um, 
more intensive sort of scheduled chemical treatments on their hives, more intensive acid-based treatments on their hives, which are considered more of an organic measurement. Um, and, and for me, being a person that grew food and grew food for community, it was important that I worked with my bees in that same way. Um, and so I do use some acid-based treatments on my hive, but I try to keep my treatment um, measures low. I always, always, always test for Varroa and keep track of um, the pests that are in my hives, and then I react to that based on um, what my different yards need. And sometimes that means I need to apply treatments, and sometimes it doesn't, but I never just sort of blanket apply treatments um, because I don't think that it's best for the vitality of the hives. Um, and I would love to be in a space where I can move to being completely treatment-free, um, but mm-hmm. that takes time and knowledge and the cultivation of healthy bees that can survive in our ecosystem. And so it's really hard to just start off as a new beekeeper and be completely treatment-free. Um, but that is sort of the, mm-hmm. the golden nugget that we hold out here at Yardbirds is to be able to move towards that. Yeah, and so how do you choose what farms you bring your hives to? Do you ever bring your bees to a non-organic farm? Do you bring them to um, IPM farms? Do you have to kind of go through a checklist of what your bees are going to be encountering whenever you bring them outside of your own farm? You know, it's it's really tricky because it's not just the farm that I bring them to, but what's also going on around that farm because bees forage Mm. Anywhere, I mean, they can forage three to eight miles, but typically you're thinking in a three-mile radius and bees are going to be foraging. And so you have to know what's happening, not just where you are, but what are the wind breaks that could, or the lack of wind breaks that could in, um, impact pesticide drift from one farm to another. Um, what are the... Um, what are the chemical applications that are happening on that farm? What are the... Um, the practices that are being used around chemical applications to ensure that they're not they're not drifting or being sprayed from too high up so that those chemicals are getting um, everywhere. I always really try to visit a site a year before and a couple of times that year so I can look for things like um, native pollinator presence and mm. um, the health of wildflowers at a farm. Um, I don't bring or keep my bees on conventional farms. I mean, it, I think partially it's really just that I, I don't run in circles where I would be asked to bring my bees to a conventional farm. Um, but I do talk with and negotiate with people who need pollination services who are integrated pest management farms as well as organic practicing farms. And um, we just have to have an ongoing conversation about what practices they're using, when they're applying chemicals, and it's really crucial that that conversation continues to be open because I need to react or move bees if they need to do something for their farm's vitality that could have an impact on bee health. Yeah, totally. And so you mentioned different times of the year and different seasons. The farm will need to do things, um, and you'll need to do things for your bees. So Mm -hmm. in the cycle of the year, what do you need to do during each season, kind of like top three things or bullet points that you need to do to keep your bees happy and healthy and um, be able to maintain that vitality in your hive? Yeah, so so in the Northeast, we have a fairly short beekeeping season, and so in the springtime, it's pretty vital that you make sure your hives have enough room so that they don't swarm. Um, you feed mm. them if necessary because um, our, wind, our springs have been starting later and later in New England, and so it's really important that they have um, supplemental feed if there's not good forage out, like if it's a really rainy spring or really cold spring. Um, so those are two big spring things. In the summer, making sure that there's room enough to spread out the nectar to dehydrated into honey is really important um, because you don't want your hives to get honey bound, which is when they pack honey into the center where they would, the queen would typically lay eggs. Um, and if that happens, then the hives will swarm um, unnaturally and you'll lose half your hive. Um, and then the other big, important, huge thing is always testing for mice at different times in the year. So I typically test in the spring, the summer, and the fall so I can make informed decisions about treatments and track um, mite levels throughout the year. 
And then obviously in New England, winterizing hives and making sure that they have everything that they need to stay dry and warm um, through the winter is really crucial to survivability. And how do you do that, keep them dry and warm in a New England winter? Yeah, so you, uh, we here, we wrap our hives in something called Reflectex, which is like a silver bubble wrap. Looks like a bee spacesuit. Um, we wrap that all day. <laughs> <place. laughs> it's really funny. Um, all the hives here on the farm right now, like, like little spaceship. Um, so we wrap it, we wrap the hives in that. Uh, we make sure they have an upper entrance, um, and a lower entrance so that airflow can move through the hives. Um, we put rims on the top in case we have to feed our bees so we can add feed to the tops of the hives easily. Um, and we make sure that the, the inner cover is well insulated. Some beekeepers also put in a board that helps draw moisture um, because sometimes moisture will pool on the inside of the inner cover. I do that with my larger hives but not with my smaller hives. Um, and the only reason I don't do it with my smaller hives is I just don't have the time. So... Ideally, you'd be able to put a moisture board on top of each hive. Mm -hmm. And so all this love and care and work for these little communities of bees making honey and wax, um, how do you collect those products and then what do you do with them? Yeah, so honey is, we do honey in two ways. A couple times a year we do a call out to our customers um, and we take orders for comb honey, which is um honey that we cut straight from the hive, from the honeycomb. Um, and that's a fairly simple process. We take our orders, we get out our tables, we cut our honeycomb, and we pack it in wax paper, and then um, we deliver it to our different customers or have them come to the farm and pick it up. Uh, and then we also do honey extracted, which is the liquid form that you typically see in the bottles at the store. Um, and for that, you we collect our honey twice a year, once in the summer and once in the fall. Um, and we extract it using a radial extractor, which spins. So you cut the wax cappings off the top, and you put the frames inside of this giant spinning machine. Um, and it spins the frames around, and all of the honey sticks to the outer walls of this machine and then drips down into um, a holding tank underneath the machine. Um, Whoa. So it, yeah, hugely laborious <laughs> and time-consuming process. Um, and we sell our honey at a couple different places. We sell it to um, Belly of the Beast in Northampton, um, the Five Eyed Fox in Turner's Falls, the Alba Stone in Montague. Um, and there, there are pretty consistent wholesale honey customers. And we also sell our honey straight from the farm um, for pickup on Tuesdays, on, on Fridays and Saturdays. And um, we do do a couple of holiday markets, usually in Northampton um, and sometimes in Boston. And that is basically how we move our product. Wax, I sell wholesale to um, people who make cosmetic products. And I also make a couple of different types of, like, body balm and body butter. Um, but over the years, we've really moved away from that because there's so many great herbalists in the community here that it actually behooves mm. us to sell the wax over the product. Interesting. Yeah. So um, you mentioned that you have pickup days at your farm. So where can mm -hmm. people find you? Where is your farm? Yeah, we are in Montague. We're right down the road from the book mill. Um, and our farm is at 258 Greenfield Road in Montague. Um, so if you're on the same street as the book mill, you come all the way down until the street dead ends. We are the last house right there. Um, wow. That's funny. Yeah. I know. It's <laughs> wonderful. Um, um, so uh, I just want to quick wrap up with um, who should come to your first of two workshops, and first and second, um, starting on March 3rd about beekeeping. Like, who should come? What will you cover? Kind of like a quick synopsis of um, what that's going to look like and the information you're going to be giving. Yeah, great question. So the way that this two-part workshop is designed is that we do honeybee hive sort of anatomy, biology basics in the first workshop. And so we'll be going over what's going on inside the hive, the different roles of different casts um, of the beehive, 
and how you manage for the most success here in the Northeast. And then in the second part, we are going to do, um, we're going to do some management planning exercises. So we're going to do an apiary action plan. So we're going to think about either where our apiary is now and what, how we want it to grow, or um, if we're just getting started, what we want our apiary to be like, what the most ideal setup for our apiary is based on where we are and what we know about bees from um, both the first workshop and the second. And then we're going to sketch out that plan. So it's really great for beginners to start this way because you'll learn about anatomy and management, and then we'll think about, okay, what do we do next? So it's not just like, here's a brain dump of information. Good luck. <laughs> um, and then um, if you're getting, you know, and you're, you're in the first couple of years of beekeeping and you're feeling like you need to make a shift or you have, still have a lot of questions, which is totally normal, um, it's a great time to come and do some review of that hive anatomy and management, talk through some of your management practices and my management practices, see how they differ um, or are the same, and then based on that, make a new plan for how you're going to manage from here forward. Awesome. That sounds like it's going to be really helpful for a lot of people who are interested in apiaries and beekeeping. Um, so, again, your workshops are going to be happening on March 3rd from 9 to 1 and March 10th from 9 to 1 um, at the Montague Common Hall. And you can find more information about that on NOFA's website, nofamath.org. Um, slash events, and um, I only have one more question for you, and that's um, something I have felt myself my whole life is that bees are just startlingly cute, and do you have any, <laughs> do you give your bees names or your hive names, or do you do any oh, of that? Well, naming each individual <laughs> one would be a lot, because there's, you know, yeah. Anywhere from 30 to 100,000 of them. So that could take most of the summer. <laughs> yeah, that would be a lot of this naming. <laughs> yeah. And they're pretty hard to tell apart. <laughs> um, but, yeah, we, you know, when we had less hives, we used to manage them by naming our queens. Um, oh, so naming, cool. Naming the hive would help us name, um, sort of keep track and management. And that's something I encourage people to do when they're first getting started because it's a good way to differentiate. Now, because we're doing more breeding, we have different lines, and so we actually use color coding to keep track of um, different lines of bees um, that come from mother queens that we're, we've worked with from the breeders we purchased from. Oh, cool. And so what's your favorite queen name that you've ever had? Oh, one of my best ones was Alexandria. I remember. Ooh, very royal. Yeah, very royal. I think she, that queen is <laughs> five or six years. She was pretty impressive. Oh, that's so cool. Angela, yeah. thank you so much for taking the time to talk to me today. I really appreciate it. Um, and again, everyone can check out your workshop on the NOFA Mass website, and we are so excited to be hosting it. Um, and I hope that your spring is wonderful and dry and that all of your hives flourish. Thank you so much, Lydia. Take good care. You too. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. It was so nice of Angela to humor me with that last question. If you want more information about Yardbirds Farm and Angela's apiary, head over to yardbirdsfarm.com. And don't forget, I mean, how could you forget? I mentioned it like a million times in the interview. But don't forget, their two-part workshop on all things bees, March 3rd and 10th. And for more info on that and to register, go to nofamass.org. Okay, friends, it's time for this episode's Farm Hacks and Farm Fails. This is the part of the show where you get to call in and share what you did this week, month, or season that was just pure genius. Or to lament about something that went a little sideways. Let's have the bad news first. Hi there. I'm calling with a farm fail. It was uh, Christmas vacation the last couple weeks and it's been very cold. I've been home at the farm, but I have been deliberately trying to be on vacation and not very not really check in on what's going on in the farm. And we had probably I don't know, four or five tons of different root vegetables 
in a storage. It's a it's an insulated truck body that uh, has sometimes gotten gotten a little frozen when it gets real cold. Temperatures have been below 10 degrees for about a week and a half now, and I just kind of didn't check in on it and see what was going. And I've got all those root crops are now frozen solid, and I hope that they're I hope that they're going to be okay. I've got a little heater in there and trying to thaw it out, uh, so we'll see how that goes. Thanks, bud. Oof, that is a wicked bummer. Maybe you need to hook up with like a local juice bar. I wonder how many carrot smoothies that would make. Okay, on to the good news. Our farm hack. Hi, Lydia. I'm calling with a farm hack. It was an, a, an unintentioned victory that we had this year. For the last two or three years, we've been spreading wood chips everywhere on our farm. And lo and behold, this past spring, uh, wine cap mushrooms sprung up everywhere where there was a little shade and a lot of wood chips. So at our place, we found them particularly underneath our rhubarb, which has nice big leaves for them to hide under, and also in our black raspberries. So it was a wonderful uh, harvest that we had. We dried uh, pounds and pounds and pounds of them. Uh, just because we put wood chips down under those plants and let them do their thing. Yes, that is so amazing. Good work, wood chips. Yay, mushrooms. If you have a hack or a fail that you want me to play on the show, call 413-345-5349. That's 413-345-5349. And leave your story after the beep. Thanks for listening to this week's NOFA Mass podcast hosted by me, Lydia Irons. Hope you learned something new about our little pollinator pals, bees. And for more information on the topic of today's show or to become a NOFA member, head over to nofamass.org. You can also find NOFA Mass on Facebook and this podcast on iTunes, Stitcher, or wherever fine pods are found. We record this podcast at the amazing North Fire Studio in Amherst, Mass. See you next time. In China, around 77 B.C., <laughs> okay, sorry, <clears throat> there is a book written with sections descripting, nope, I can't do it, <laughs> that's too dumb, <laughs> I know, <laughs> just don't do that can be our blooper. <laughs> Ooh.